Humans are fallible. This we definitely know. Nothing we do can be perfect. Case in point, memories. Stories. Very rarely can a story be told precisely the same way twice. Unless it's recorded and recited verbatim, the story will most definitely change. But let's put aside human error for a moment and focus on just stories. Stories are everything to a society. We are constantly taking in information about such and such event happening here and such and such event happening there. Whether it be good news, bad news, or just news, it's all stories. Stories shape culture. Stories are everything. But stories can be dangerous. Stories can build up false hope, spread slanderous lies, or stories can cause dissent. In the eternal words of writer Edward Bulwier Lytton, the pen is mightier than the sword. Or in this case, the lightsaber is mightier than the datapad because today we are talking about Star Wars. But it's not just any Star Wars topic, we're talking about a Star Wars theory, not you, that I believe, if true, could fix all of the mistakes from the sequels. For years, Star Wars fans have been saying that they'll retcon the sequels by either ignoring them or erasing them, but let's be honest, that's really never gonna happen. So I propose a different idea. We reinterpret them. Because I believe all the events that transpired between episodes 7, 8, and 9 were simply in-universe Republic propaganda. And that the true events were so deadly and bloody that the Republic was left with no choice but to falsify the events in order to save face. Before I get too far into this theory, allow me to say, no, it's not true. I'm saying this now because obviously no, they did not think about this when writing the movies, when producing the movies, or when releasing the movies. Well, honestly, they didn't have any plan when writing the movies, when producing the movies, or when releasing the movies. How, how long was this, was this in the cards? Was this sort of in the blueprint from episode seven? This has been in the blueprint for a long time. Did you know about the parentage? Like, uh, tell me about that, that journey of when you found out. No, it. and then it came to episode nine and JJ pitched me the film and was like, oh yeah, Palpatine's granddaddy. And I was like, awesome. And then two weeks later, he was like, oh, we're not sure. Regardless, this video is simply a new take on a story course correction under the guise of a theory. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's get into it. It's no secret that the sequel sucked. They were this quick, nostalgic cash grab with no real consistency and no through line of a story. It's literally the definition of too many cooks in the kitchen. They wanted to capitalize on the absolute box office money printing success that is Marvel and decided to rush out three movies without realizing they actually needed a plan. And because of that, what we got was a jumbled, inconsistent mess. The Force Awakens was essentially a retelling of A New Hope, but at least it established a decent outline of a story. The Last Jedi took everything The Force Awakens set up and got rid of it all. It changed some characters and sidelined others and didn't really go anywhere. Then we had The Rise of Skywalker, where the majority of the movie was spent fixing the mess The Last Jedi made, and then I guess brought back the Emperor, because why not? Somehow Palpatine returned. Needless to say, it sucked. There wasn't one singular vision, and what we got in the end was a clash of different creators and tones that just didn't meld. Stepping back and looking at 7, 8, and 9 from a strictly narrative perspective, it's just, well, it's a mess. I'm not going to go into a full retelling of each movie, rather I want to talk about some inconsistencies and failings of the story. Let's begin with Rey. She lives on a desert planet, can fly anything, fix anything, and is the best at using a lightsaber in the forest without even training. In episode 8, she's told that her parents are nobodies, and then in 9, it's retconned to be that she's actually Palpatine's granddaughter. Then in the very end, after proving that she's more than her namesake and that she's her own person not beholden to family legacies, she decides to become a Skywalker. For reasons. None of her story makes any sense. Again, it's as if multiple people are trying to tell a story. And these people don't really know how Jedi work or who they are. If anything, it's very reminiscent of real world mythology. Heroes come from nothing and suddenly have great skill and power when the need arises. Rey is portrayed in an almost deific manner that over time evolves her character to be seen as a perfect and fallible icon. Compare that to Luke and Anakin. We know they went through struggles and we saw their training and their rise. Everything with them felt earned because we saw it. Rey is perfect from the get-go. She has next to no training because when briefly telling a story, that will just bog down the runtime. I mean, just imagine this. Younglings gathered around the fire listening to an old storyteller. Then Rey went to Ark 2, where she met Grandmaster Luke Skywalker. She begged and pleaded for him to train her, but the old master had forsaken the Jedi. 
It's time for the Jedi to end, he would say. Despite her sheer force of will and demonstration of power, the old master still said no. Feeling a strange disturbance in the Force, Rey would leave her reluctant master, telling him she needs to help bring the evil Kylo Ren back to the light. If this was written down, you'd probably elaborate more on the story and say, yeah, Luke drank some green titty milk and at one point Rey could talk to Kylo through the Force or some shit. But verbally, you'd tell it like that. Continuing on from Rey, let's get into the First Order. They don't make any sense at all. Their rise to power over the three movies literally makes zero logical sense. To paraphrase the Templin Institute who made a fantastic comparison, the First Order's rise to power would be as if during World War II, Japan nuked DC, then hours later, Japan's only nuclear launch site is destroyed by American rebels. Then one day later, those same rebels kill the Emperor of Japan and destroy most of their fleet, skip ahead one year later, and now Japan controls the whole world. Japan is then gifted hundreds of nukes from some unknown benefactor, which results in the entire world uniting to destroy them, that's essentially what happened in the First Order Resistance War. As I understand it, the First Order were Imperial remnants who hid away in the unknown regions, licking their wounds. The Resistance were a paramilitary offshoot of the New Republic because they don't have a standing army anymore, apparently. Then, once the New Republic knew of the First Order, they still did nothing. To tie this back into World War II again, this is as if we knew a large contingent of Nazis escaped to Argentina after the war and were actively bolstering their numbers and growing a new empire. And the world did nothing. Nothing about the First Order makes any sense. One attack from the First Order completely dismantled 40 years of progress. I've played Civ before. You destroy the capital, it just moves to a new city. The Republic had no contingencies in case this happened. Why would the New Republic do this? Why would they let such a massive threat grow in strength? Why get rid of your standing army and why surrender to what is essentially a rogue nation? And most importantly, how could both the New Republic and the First Order be defeated so easily? Nothing makes sense. Why was Finn not apprehensive about killing the brainwashed stormtroopers? Why was Poe a non-factor? Why was Rose forgotten? How was Rey this godlike perfect Jedi figure? Why did the Death Star fragments remain so intact? How can Rey force heal? Why is it that somehow Palpatine returned? I could literally make an entire video about all the retcons and inconsistencies the sequels stupidly create, but I want to focus on one word here. Inconsistent. Psychologist Mark Goddard once wrote an article titled Mythology, What Purpose Do Myths Serve in Society and Culture? Where he states that, at the simplest level, a myth is an attempt to make sense of things. Humans wish to understand why there is something rather than nothing. Where did this strange world come from? Myths are stories that explain such things. The Merriam-Webster definition of a myth is a traditional story of ostensibly historical events that serve to unfold part of the worldview of a people or explain a practice, belief, or natural phenomenon. In essence, a myth is a justification, a safety net, a blanket. Myths provide comfort to those who seek an understanding of the unknown. However, it's also really interesting to see just how closely myth and propaganda overlap with one another. Propaganda is defined as the spreading of ideas, information, or rumors for the purpose of helping or injuring an institution, a cause, or a person. Myth and propaganda both dangerously ride the same line. If there's too much government interference into a myth, it suddenly becomes propaganda. Propaganda is a way to manipulate and change the narrative. So, propaganda under the guise of a myth is a very dangerous weapon. Yet every story has a flicker of truth within it. This is where my theory comes in. I believe that the events of the First Order Resistance War were so detrimental to the New Republic that it was in their best interest to falsify the events that transpired over the year-long conflict. The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, and The Rise of Skywalker were simply in-universe propaganda. In order to prove this and remain within the lore, let's establish some consistencies. Through episodes 7, 8, and 9, there were a handful of events that we'll just call fixed points. These fixed points are essentially massive in-universe events that the universe couldn't ignore, such as the death of a prominent individual or the loss of a planet. So let's get into some fixed points. After the fall of the Empire, a faction of Imperial remnants went off to the unknown regions and bolstered their numbers, eventually forming into the First Order. The First Order was led by Kylo Ren, master of the Knights of Ren, and the elusive Supreme Leader Snoke. During this time, Luke Skywalker managed to restart the Jedi Order and recruit quite a few Padawan. 
However, sometime later the temple would be destroyed and all of his students killed, resulting in his self-imposed exile to Ak-2. The First Order would eventually go into open conflict with a paramilitary organization separate from the Republic known as the Resistance. The First Order Resistance War only lasted one single year and resulted in the deaths of many Republic heroes such as Vice Admiral Holdo, Admiral Akbar, General Leia Organa, Han Solo, and Luke Skywalker. The war also caused the planetary destruction of Quartzilius, Ratio, Hosnian, Cardota, Hosnian Prime, and Kajimi. During the war, three resistance heroes grew into legends. A Jedi known as Rey, a rogue stormtrooper named Finn, and a pilot named Poe Dameron. Nearing the end of the war, a mysterious transmission broadcasting the voice of the late Emperor Palpatine was delivered across the galaxy promising his inevitable revenge. In the end, the First Order was destroyed and the Resistance reigned supreme. Here is the biggest question. So what happened? If we go into episodes 7, 8, and 9 under the assumption that they are merely in-universe propaganda, then what actually happened? Well, here's my take. The New Republic wanted to be something wholly unique. They wanted to be immune to corruption, to the rise of evil. They wanted to make it so no one individual could corrupt the government from the inside as Palpatine once did. So how did they do that? The Military Disarmament Act. In canon, this was a law passed by the New Republic that severely limited the makeup and operations of the New Republic's defense fleet and army, reducing the overall size of the army by 90%. All this was done in the name of peace. Chancellor Mon Mothma made it very clear that she wanted to demilitarize the New Republic and make the remaining military a peacekeeping force. This idealism was their downfall. In the face of all evidence, they remained blind idealists. Out of the unknown regions came the First Order, who began unifying the Outer Rim worlds, worlds that had been historically ignored by the Republic, new and old. This force, despite being Imperial remnants, actually helped a lot of the Outer Rim worlds become prosperous, so much so that many worlds wanted to secede from the Republic. Fearing a new Confederacy of Independent Systems situation being born, the New Republic allowed the First Order to claim rights over the Outer Rim worlds and become their own separate government. Much infighting began within the Republic, however, many of those voices were stamped out all in the name of peace. At this point in time, the current leaders of the New Republic hadn't fought in the war, they were merely politicians who grew up in peace times. They didn't witness firsthand what the Empire was capable of. They were so caught up in their own fantasy of peace, they couldn't see the new threat brewing. Enraged, the leaders of the past war, General Organa, Akbar, and a few others, stepped down from the government and began developing the resistance. If their own government wouldn't fight, they would. I'd liken this whole situation to the Peloponnesian War. Essentially, the Athenians and the Spartans get into an all-out war after a decades-long peace treaty falls apart. You have Athens, the city-state responsible for the Golden Age of Greece where many inventions and advancements were created. Engineering, philosophy, theater, and mathematics were all essentially birthed here. At the time, they're the most advanced civilization in the world. Then you have Sparta, responsible for the most deadly, skilled, and feared warriors in the whole world. From birth, children were examined to see if they were physically capable of serving in the army. If not, they were cast aside to die. From there, the children would train for most of their lives and eventually become these deadly Spartans. This minor form of eugenics, mixed with lifelong military training, essentially created the ancient equivalent of super soldiers. The war itself was actually caused by Athens because they constantly broke the peace treaty and tested Sparta time and time again. The Athenians were arrogant and saw themselves as better than the Spartans. However, in the end, it was Sparta who reigned supreme. Throughout the war, Athenians committed atrocity after atrocity, and once Sparta had control of the city-state, they refused to destroy it, much to the chagrin of their allies. Sparta allowed the city to remain because they recognized the good Athens had done for Greece, despite their less-than-honorable nature. Now liken this to the New Republic. They are Athens. They dismantled their army and pursued a more academic cause. This was the new golden age of the Republic. For the first time in who knows how many thousand years, the Republic was innovating in a multitude of subjects. Technology became more advanced, galactic culture expanded, ventures into entertainment and philosophy grew. It was the beginning of a utopia. While they may have been in the right, 
The arrogance of the new leaders cast aside the wisdom of the old for their own self-righteousness. Then you have the First Order. They are Sparta. However, unlike Sparta, they weren't noble. They only sought revenge. The unified Outer Rim worlds may have been happy with the First Order rule, but ignorance is bliss. In the poorer regions, First Order troops would steal children in the night and force them into servitude, training and brainwashing them from childhood. Not only this, the First Order would constantly test the limits of the New Republic, stretching the bounds of their treaty. What the First Order lacked in innovation, they made up for in strength. The New Republic barely had a fighting force, whereas the First Order had the most deadly soldiers the galaxy had ever seen. A war eventually broke out, and the New Republic was helpless to the First Order's onslaught. The blind idealists finally had their eyes opened. However, despite the overwhelming odds, the Resistance managed to fight back and win against the First Order. They were tyrannical. Its whole government system was built around the madness of one man who had little regard for the state of the galaxy after his demise. Despite all their power, the First Order was built on a deck of cards. Knock them over and the whole thing comes crashing down. In the aftermath of the war, the New Republic had a choice. Continue down their old ways or realize the nature of reality. In order to maintain peace and control, the Republic began propagandizing the war, saying it was a complete surprise attack and that the Republic always backed the resistance or that the evil Palpatine was responsible for all of this. They began spreading stories, some correlating, some not, because imagine if you were in their position. A government's job is to protect its people. They knowingly allowed a faction of Imperial remnants to fester and grow in power. This power then resulted in the destruction of the entire Hosnian system and the planet Kajimi. Not only that, but Republic heroes died in mass. If you found out your government was responsible for all that death and all that destruction, all due to their negligence and blind idealism, do you think you'd be okay with that? No. There would be chaos on a galactic scale the likes of which they had never seen before. That's why we have these stories that don't make sense. They feel like rehashes of something we've heard before because nostalgia blinds. Story inconsistencies, individuals acting out of character, all of that was falsified in order to keep the peace. Because after all, ignorance is bliss. Now, I could continue on and explain all the ins and outs of the real First Order Resistance War, but it almost works better if it remains ambiguous. The war was so deadly and bloody that it caused the deaths of heroes thought to be immortal and the loss of six planets all in one single year. The story almost works better if we'd never know what actually happens because it plays on the fear of the unknown. Sure, there are always hints of truth within every myth, but in this instance, who knows? Maybe the broadcast of the Emperor was done by the Republic in a false flag operation. Maybe Starkiller Base never existed and was simply falsified because the First Order's real super weapon was far deadlier and more terrifying. Maybe Luke didn't abandon the Jedi or try to kill his nephew at all. Because think about it, why would the man who saw the good in Darth Vader and chose not to kill him suddenly try to kill his defenseless nephew who hadn't done anything yet? Maybe in actuality, after the loss of his students from some unknown means, he set off searching for answers. And when asking for help, the New Republic simply turned their back on him. They falsified the events to make themselves look better while making Luke look worse. When looking at the sequels under the guise of in-universe propaganda, it actually makes them a lot more enjoyable. With the thought that the true war was far more deadly and that the movies we are watching were made to hide the truth, it actually makes your brain run wild imagining all the story potential. So I want to leave this up to you guys. With the fixed points mentioned before, I want to hear what you think happened. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. I'd love to hear your interpretation, and also let me know your thoughts about the theory too. This idea has been brewing in my head for a while now, and it actually feels really good to finally get it out. Regardless, don't expect any more theories in the future. This is a one and done. I've made that mistake once in the past before. <laughs> Never again. <laughs>